All right, hey everyone. Uh, thanks coming. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, server-side micro front end. So um, just a quick show of hands. Uh, who of you actually attended the two uh, previous talks on micro front ends and web components? Okay. So uh, I'm guessing at this stage you're probably a bit familiar with the concept of micro front ends. So I do have uh, a section of the slides uh, dedicated to uh, an overview of uh, micro front end. So I'm just gonna talk about it briefly because I don't really want to uh, repeat what the other speakers have uh, sort of like explained. And I'm gonna try and just focus on, I guess, some of the learnings that, uh, that I've, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, draw from, uh, from our experience at work. So, so the talk today uh, is uh, about server-side micro front ends. And if you see uh, this wonderful um, cover image, uh, I actually made it myself. Uh, you know, that sort of gives you an idea of my sense of, uh, um, you know, uh, my capability in actually uh, uh, graphic design. So it's not very good, but there is sort of like a theme that I want to sort of like carry forward throughout this presentation. So just to uh, begin with in <clears throat> an introduction. So uh, my name is uh, Herdy Hendoko. Uh, one thing that I actually didn't put on that slide, unfortunately. <laughs> So I'm a software engineer uh, for Standard Chartered Bank. So uh, I'm currently uh, working in a few different uh, technologies, uh, Scala, Kotlin, and TypeScript. Uh, also doing a little bit of DevOps uh, whenever it's uh, required. Uh, try to be a little bit active in the community. So I have a couple of uh, open source projects, doing a lot of uh, experimentations in GitHub. Uh, most notably, you know, just trying to get GraalVM native image to work with some of my uh, own project. Uh, also, uh, you might have seen me if you've attended to one of the uh, Scala uh, meetup group. Uh, I help organize the uh, meetup events with the other organizers. And I'm also an engineers.sg volunteer. If you don't know who engineers.sg uh, are, uh, basically uh, we are the one that will, they are recording your uh, uh, video, uh, presentations and publishing it. So you can find me on uh, social media, uh, find me on Twitter, uh, have a GitHub account, and also have a very poorly maintained uh, personal site. So, so for today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about micro front ends, uh, the concept and core ideas, just to refresh your memory a little bit, um, and also touch briefly on some of the technology options uh, that is uh, available uh, in order to adopt micro front ends, and then uh, walk you through uh, some of our uh, learning experience uh, at work. So, you know, some of the reasons why we chose to adopt micro front end, uh, some of the architecture and technology choices that we make, some of the challenges and benefits, uh, and, you know, things that we uh, would like to consider in the future. So, let's begin with an overview of micro front end. So, I'm not really going to go into too much depth uh, on this section because. Uh, Really, uh, I don't really want to have to re uh, don't really want to repeat uh, a lot of what the previous uh, speakers have said. Uh, so, if you have to sort of like sum uh, micro front end in one uh, sentence, really, it's uh, you can think of it as uh, extending the concept of microservice to the front end. So, whereas microservice, you would probably publish uh, API uh, in micro front ends, you actually push that sort of like abstraction uh, to the uh, front end, the UI as well. So not only that you will deliver data, you will also deliver a piece of uh, UI and functionality along with it. So all this uh, resource in this section is available on this website called micro-frontends.org. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but on the bottom of the slide, I do put some links into some of the resource uh, that I mentioned uh, on my slides. So uh, the core idea of micro front ends itself, that an app you can think of it as a composition of features that is, uh, can be uh, owned by different teams, whereas each team itself, they are responsible to deliver uh, some specific uh, business uh, mission or functionality. And because the idea of micro front ends is that that particular team has to be autonomous, uh, they have to take care uh, the delivery from end to end, that means that each team would have some cross-functional uh, uh, capabilities. So, and I will explain this a bit later. So, uh, whereas before, say in the company, you might have uh, a team that 
focuses solely on backend um, development. Uh, in micro front ends, you have to have someone uh, or some capability of actually delivering some UI functionality as well. But micro front end itself is actually not, not, it's not a new concept. It's sort of like been done before. And uh, if you think about it, the concept itself, it's actually not that new. You know, it kind of like makes sense in a way. Uh, microphone is just like a nice buzzword. So if you talk to someone, you say microphone ends, you know, you got uh, bonus points for that. But in the past, you know, there are, uh, I guess, patterns called front end integration for verticalized system, self-contained systems. Um, in the mobile world, there are already existing uh, patterns uh, such as macro apps. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you users uh, grab I mean, you can sort of like see this sort of like pattern um, in the home page of that app itself, where it's actually dividing uh, kind of like uh, sections between transport uh, and some other stuff. I think one of the most extreme example, um, we don't see it in here in Singapore, I mean, but if I say go back to Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, I would open my Gojek app, I would order food. You'd actually see a list of uh, sort of like mini apps uh, in there. So if you are interested in the transport, you would actually click on transport uh, icon and it will take you uh, to you know, its own sort of like, uh, I guess, area. If I'm interested in food delivery, it will take me to a uh, sort of like a separate area as well, each with its own sort of like uh, different uh, distinct flow. So it's not new. So um, in terms of, um, I guess, the higher level view, uh, this is also similar to what Nurul and Ritesh has presented. So I'm, all, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the monolith where you have a, uh, an application which is uh, tightly coupled. So everything uh, is um, one. And then you have the more traditional front and back uh, development team uh, separation, whereas the back end and DevOps uh, or rather ops uh, team actually takes care of the services delivery, and then the front end team would actually develop all the UI niceties. And more commonly these days, you would have uh, a separation within all these different microservices. You might have some aggregation layer uh, in the middle, uh, so something like uh, GraphQL, so, or like a common API gateway. And then on top of that, you have the front end teams. So with micro front ends, uh, really what uh, the end goal is, to actually continue the separation up uh, to the UI level. So instead of having various microservices that communicates through a common gateway, and then you have a big UI monolith, what you want to do is actually to extend that sort of responsibility end to end. So in this sort of like example, you have uh, four teams that have uh, an area of responsibility. Uh, so Team Inspire in this example uh, helps the customer to discover products. So you can um, uh, basically uh, create leads uh, to, I guess, generate more sales. Uh, same, similarly, you have Team Search that actually provides the functionality uh, to help customers uh, find the right product and so on. And by the way, um, all of these graphs, uh, I did not make it myself. It's all available on the micro front ends website. <coughs> So if I, have to, so if I have to explain it in a picture, this is sort of like what it looks like. So in a web page, you will probably have uh, basically what they call the container or what we normally, uh, well, our own term is called the shell. It's responsibility is kind of like orchestrating between all these different components together. So kind of like a routing uh, and basically uh, some uh, bit of logic. You'd have uh, in here three teams, product, checkout, and inspire. So Team Inspire would actually build their own micro front end that will actually show the customer uh, some of the related products uh, that actually uh, relevant to the current, you know, what they're seeing right now. And when they're actually ready to buy, then uh, this particular functionality, checkout, add to cart, and then uh, completing the purchase would be handled by a different team. So one of the key things about micro front ends, it's uh, also trying to be able to uh, well, trying to promote technology, uh, trying to be a technology agnostic. In this example, uh, in the website, they have like all these three teams actually uh, building uh, their own components in uh, different technology stacks. So that previous example, um, you know, we have like the 
pretty much the single page application frameworks. But really, as I mentioned before, micro front-ends is not really about the technology, but it's more of a sort of like an approach, uh, architectural and also team organization. Uh, there are <coughs> excuse me, a few different uh, technology um, that allows you to build or help you to build a micro front ends. So you have the single spa meta framework. I believe Ritesh and Nurul uh, mentioned this technology. Uh, you can even sort of have it um, to host uh, a few different SPAs uh, separated by the, you know, where they're actually hosted in the, uh, I guess, the website itself. So you might have, say, checkout uh, hosted under slash checkout, and for products, you have something under slash product. Obviously, it's not uh, very well integrated, but it's an option if you're trying to move from what you have a, a legacy application monolith uh, or uh, the microservice one. Uh, into a micro front end um, architectural style. But one of the most popular one uh, is actually web components. Uh, um, uh, you know, I think it's uh, been mentioned several times in uh, this uh, conference. So I think that's uh, one of the key uh, piece of technology that is actually getting more popular. Now that uh, part is uh, on, on, the, on the left hand side, we're talking about the client side um, uh, technology options. Um, actually, we do also have the client side includes, uh, which kind of works uh, uh, similar. So you uh, actually retrieve the resource uh, from the client side and then uh, load it uh, asynchronously. But uh, what I'm want to talk about uh, today is actually the server side uh, part of the micro front ends. So uh, it's not uh, meant to be sort of like uh, trying to convince you that server side is the best, uh, but merely just showing you a different option. So on the server side itself, we have edge side includes and server side includes. <coughs> so before we start, uh, just to give a bit of context. Um, so what it is that we're trying to solve with microphone and so uh, for us uh, itself, it's uh, actually trying to help uh, with this uh, problem of reinvention because, uh, you know, in our own experience, um, you know, we're working on uh, sort of like this uh, different projects. Uh, normally what we, um, you know, it's kind of like deja vu sometimes, you know, you have to build uh, a piece of uh, functionality. You know that you've sort of like built this in a project uh, before in the past, but uh, now you're sort of like repeating yourself. So, which is kind of like, um, I wouldn't say natural, but you know, you uh, do sort of um, expect a degree of uh, duplication. Um, so this, mic this approach, micro front end, uh, is uh, one way to actually help to reduce that sort of like uh, duplication between uh, actually trying to deliver functionality in different projects. So, you know, uh, with the existing uh, most commonly uh, when you have a, a, a project uh, or uh, an application or product, usually it's uh, uh, built in uh, the normal microservices style, which means it's a monolith UI. So unless you actually have a very strong uh, standard across project, uh, you know, one framework, specific version, diff uh, uh, a very uh, fixed uh, style of development, it, the code is actually going to be hard to port and reuse across different projects. Um, and one problem that is actually um, more uh, important to us uh, is actually the problem of uh, keeping the domain knowledge. Uh, because, you know, when you're working on a project, uh, you know, I guess implicitly you, you sort of like gather all this sort of like knowledge about what you're developing. And uh, if you're developing for one and then you move on to work on, say, another project or on uh, an application, um, sort of that, that knowledge is uh, probably um, uh, get lost or rather, you know, you, you started to forget about uh, some of the context of why you do things this way and uh, not the other way. And the last bit is um, just sort of like alluding to maintainability. So if you are developing and maintaining several different products, uh, it actually, um, with, with the normal sort of like architectural styles, uh, you know, it's actually um, a lot more expensive to um, ensure that enhancements uh, and fixes are applied uh, across all the different uh, application portfolio that you have. So, and I will sort of like uh, show the, well, I, I can give you a brief example on how a microphone ends uh, can fix this or help in this. And, 
The other two problems um, is our intri intrinsic dependencies, uh, because in the normal uh, microservices style, you would probably have uh, a lot of different apps depending on that one, um, say, microservice. Uh, and if you actually have to push an update to your one microservice, uh, it actually uh, takes a bit of a coordination effort to actually push this into production. You have to make sure all the downstream services are all in sync with one another. And uh, with dynamic coupling, so I'm just, <clears throat> this is uh, probably something that um, uh, we've, I guess, maybe quite relevant to us because our services tends to evolve quite uh, fast, you know, we, we actually have to deliver a feature, we have to change the, uh, um, say, the payload of the service or just, uh, you know, some of the structure. And uh, it takes uh, quite a lot of effort to keep the UI and uh, this API itself in sync. Uh, and sometimes you have to move across different repos just to keep them uh, two together in sync. So when you try to deploy, you have to make sure that the uh, version of the UI you're developing can consume the new services uh, that you just um, uh, updated. Of course, uh, you know, um, extra effort, but it can also be automated. Uh, you know, you can use various testing methodologies. Of course, you will always have the integration test. Uh, you can have contract-based testing and so on. So what are the goals uh, of microfrontends? So for us, uh, number one thing is basically domain knowledge. So we can actually now think of um, the team organization uh, more centered towards the domain, business domain and capabilities. So you can have teams uh, that have the expertise towards, uh, you know, actually um, generating recommendations or uh, one that is actually focusing on <coughs> composting data of your customer uh, portfolio and one that actually looks at the customer profile. And um, this domain-specific knowledge, uh, you know, because one team uh, is responsible for one part of the, I guess, um, one, one area of the business, this, it's actually easier to actually transfer this knowledge across different regions or markets because there's a, a lot, well, the context uh, and the knowledge is sort of like retained. Um, and uh, one thing to note here, uh, although you, know, you have sort of like these teams uh, that are specialized in one area of the business, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's a fixed uh, arrangement. So there are uh, some fluidity in this. So what we want is to actually have uh, <coughs> teams uh, that can actually, uh, team members that can still move around depending on the needs of the, the project and application, uh, task, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and the other part, uh, which is also uh, quite a nice uh, side effect is in terms of development. So whereas before, it's actually um, quite, uh, um, this, uh, this, it takes quite a lot of ceremony to actually bring a feature to production because uh, at first you have to, uh, so if you uh, start from the back end, you develop the service, you make sure that it's uh, actually exposing the right data structure and the API, and then you have to move on to the UI and then make sure that you know, the UI consume that data uh, correctly and you get the right behavior. Uh, but with micro front end, because you're, team is sort of like in control of uh, everything. Uh, you can sort of like do this development locally until the last point where you actually have a fully for, uh, working component. Uh, and then uh, the next step is actually to just uh, embed, sort of embed that component in the, the final application or the shell, so-called. And one nice uh, other feature is the independent deployment. So it's sort of like, um, okay, so there's, uh, we, we break the coupling a little bit. Uh, there's still some coupling, but uh, in terms of release um, and deployment. So each, um, each I, I would call it vertical, each vertical can set their own development schedules. Because uh, if say the, uh, the component itself, uh, you know, you try to uh, make it isolated. So uh, if you need to push say an update to the recommendation service, uh, you know, if uh, I guess nothing, um, if there's, there's no major changes in the UI uh, itself, you can actually just push this. Uh, sorry, I, uh, let me rephrase that. So if you're trying to push recommendation service uh, because the component is kind of like isolated in the UI, as long as you don't uh, do a change, you don't need to integrate it with the sort of like the shell of the routing. Say you have a, a different page that you need to hook this component to, uh, then it's pretty much independent. The moment you push, say, the recommendation service, uh, 
then the users will have, say, you know, uh, the uh, latest version. And the other uh, uh, benefit of uh, uh, it as well is risk containment. So it's actually, uh, well, in our experience, easier to uh, actually uh, contain the complexity of a particular feature and also try to debug them because uh, you have the, ex uh, well, in that particular vertical, you have everything working end to end. So it's uh, quite easy and quite fast to debug along with the test as well. <clears throat> so just uh, quickly, uh, why we chose the server um, side technologies. So when we were actually uh, uh, planning for uh, this, to build this application, we look at the customer requirements. And uh, one of the key things is that, uh, you know, this uh, particular requirements is that it's gonna be a content heavy a web application. Uh, and there are some interactivity, it's pretty limited. So this particular graph uh, is actually taken from this, um, the, the, sorry, that's the third link on the bottom. Uh, it's the, the title is the Documents to Application Continuum. So you can actually think of uh, an application or product you're developing of existing in uh, somewhere in between these two continuum. So you can either have a content-centric application or the applications, rich applications. So between those spectrum, you have sort of like a sweet spot on uh, you know, what sort of like approach you can take. So for us, uh, you know, being uh, a content heavy web application with limited interactivity, uh, server side was uh, you know, um, a good choice. And the other considerations, uh, because uh, you know, this is something that's quite new to us. So there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, and one of the key things uh, is, you know, okay, so if we wanna uh, try this out, how do we actually contain the risk? So, you know, first of all, you know, do we wanna start with a single page application? Uh, even the question, do we really need JavaScript for this? Uh, they're good choices, uh, but to be honest, they are actually uh, added a bit of a layer of complexity because micro front ends, even though we're sort of like familiar with it, when it comes time to implementation, there's sort of like a lot of gaps, a lot of missing pieces that we, you know, we actually have to take on because uh, if you look at the, your current deployment, uh, it's actually uh, sort of like geared towards the, the normal, um, say, monolith deployment. So you have everything packaged into one and then you deploy everything as a bundle, right? So with uh, micro front ends, now you're trying to separate it into uh, each vertical. So, you know, if we don't need SPAs, we don't need JavaScript, uh, we can do, uh, you know, there are JavaScript technologies there that allows for offline first uh, and progressive web app. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, it's a matter of complexity. So we um, decided that we actually gonna uh, stick with uh, the server side uh, rendering. Uh, one other consideration is uh, load time. So uh, because the market we're developing is, uh, they are um, not like Singapore. Uh, the network conditions are not uh, ideal. So um, bef sorry, between CPU and uh, network, I think what we're trying to do here is actually to optimize uh, the application to load in um, poor network latency. Um, so <clears throat> last point, as I mentioned, because we want to do uh, everything uh, automated. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the best uh, development experience. So, you know, it put a, a big emphasis on your DevOps capability because, you know, adding micro front ends uh, is not a silver bullet. You are actually adding complexity in different areas of your organization. So one part of that is your DevOps capability. <coughs> so before we start, we did look into several different uh, uh, alternatives out there. Um, there are libraries, uh, there are other companies that have uh, been uh, adopting micro front end. So three uh, key pieces of technology that we uh, looked at, uh, one, uh, Skate.js. Uh, it's basically a web components based, uh, but uh, there are some sort of like um, capabilities inside the library to allow you to actually do server-side rendering to, uh, for, from a web component. But uh, again, you know, why we didn't actually uh, look into this is because uh, it will add uh, significant complexity. Uh, there's also Node Tailor, uh, a streaming layout service. So Node and MarcoJS. Uh, so I had a chance to actually review uh, those uh, libraries. The concepts are really interesting. So especially MarcoJS, I think that's a project from eBay actually. So what it allows you to do is you actually have these front end templates 
but they have some capabilities to actually load uh, chunks of different fragments and do um, dynamic uh, reordering uh, you know, at runtime. So that's sort of like you know, technologies that are already quite mature uh, and um, you know, it can sort of like uh, take your sort of micro microphone and its implementation uh, to the next level. But what we're focusing is uh, actually just this sort of like standard, uh, what I say sort of, is because it's in draft, uh, but it's not formally accepted yet. It's called edge side includes. So uh, there's a slight difference between server side rendering and edge side includes. So with, oh, sorry, um, I'm not talking about uh, SSA, SSR. Sorry, um, with this slide, uh, why we chose server side rendering is because you know, we wanted to have um, the, to to allow the customers to actually um, experience or have a usable uh, page the moment it finished rendering, because the moment uh, in, in the principal difference between uh, a server-side rendered page or a static page compared to a single-page application is sometimes you know you have to have uh, a bit of wait uh, while all the assets, JavaScripts, and others loaded before the app becomes fully functional. So um, with server-side rendering, uh, we use this standard called uh, edge side includes. Uh, it pretty much works by embedding content. Uh, it is actually, there's a Wikipedia page about it. It's a, basically a small uh, markup language. It's been proposed to uh, uh, W3C. And the other good thing is, uh, well, although we're not actually using this particular functionality, is that you know some of your uh, proxying uh, cache uh, support this sort of like syntax. So how does it actually look? Uh, so in the, this is pretty much how it actually uh, we, how we declare it inside our code. So because it's sort of like a markup standard, um, it's uh, pretty straightforward. So uh, in the ESI include, you would actually uh, point it to the resource uh, where you want to load the, uh, say, the HTML or the uh, component. And then you can also uh, provide it with an alternative. So if the, for some reason the first uh, address doesn't actually return you any result, it'll try the alternative. And the last bit is just to actually uh, instruct um, your front end to continue processing uh, if it doesn't, uh, weren't, weren't able to actually retrieve any result. So the library we use uh, is actually called NodeSI. Uh, it implements uh, a subset of this uh, ESI standard. Uh, it's asynchronous, so it uses a, uses a promise-based interface. Um, the only uh, thing that we actually used uh, or we actually modified with uh, NodeSI is that we replace some of the underlying implementation. So with the HTTP uh, client, we actually replace it with Axios. Uh, we use Axios everywhere else in the code. And also at the same time, we wanted to be able to provide uh, a bit more information. So, you know, for logging purposes and debugging. And also um, we actually adjusted the retry strategy. In terms of the technology choices that we use, there's no big surprise. Uh, you know, there's nothing really, uh, you know, bleeding edge here. Uh, from, you know, we have both Node and Java in production. So, we have TypeScript, Express, and EGS, pretty standard stack, uh, stack for the, and uh, on other parts of the application, we have uh, Java, Spring Boot, and Timeleaf. We use Postgres and Kafka as well. In terms of the build tool uh, for this particular microphone implementation, we use Gradle and uh, kind of like uh, a default uh, backpack, which is kind of like a webpack with default settings. And uh, I think I've sort of alluded to DevOps uh, quite a bit before. So, you know, in uh, any other companies, you would find this sort of like um, similar technology uh, setup. So, you know, we manage uh, everything through uh, Jira. Uh, we do like uh, basically, uh, uh, we work, um, store our code in uh, Git and Bitbucket. And then we have the full CI CD uh, pipeline uh, that pushes everything to. Uh, say our uh, OpenShift environment, uh, which uh, we can also actually uh, replicate, uh, well, we use the scripts to actually push these things to production. Now, I have um, mentioned Docker and Docker Compose here uh, because for two things, because we're running an OpenShift, which is kind of like a package Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, on the other part of it is that we want to sort of like keep the developers happy. So we want to ensure that uh, developers can get up to speed with the uh, environment and set up uh, uh, seamlessly. So we use uh, Docker Compose for that. 
So just coming back to the, I guess, uh, so-called front-end uh, stack. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, uh, the market that we're developing, uh, you know, they don't have the best or the ideal network conditions. So what we're trying to do is optimize uh, time to first uh, render. Uh, one good thing about the Node SI library is that it actually loads what they call, call the fragments, the, the components uh, concurrently. So if you actually have like three or four fragments, uh, pretty much your time to render uh, is, depends on the critical path of the slowest uh, fragment. Uh, but uh, we don't stop there though. So we do uh, a bit of a DOM manipulation uh, prior to rendering. So, you know, it's kind of like, um, and this is why I have all this sort of like 90s art style uh, set up into my template is because uh, I don't know if you've uh, sort of like uh, used page speed a lot, um, you know, um, about a decade ago, they usually give you a lot of recommendation on how to actually make your website run fast. And this is kind of like, you know, you we're sort of like revisiting that and just trying to optimize uh, uh, using the same sort of like recommendations uh, in a sort of like a so-called modern web application. So things like, okay, so we're actually uh, grouping uh, all the uh, style sheets uh, on the head uh, to actually ensure that the styles actually get loaded before the page starts to get rendered. Uh, and one of the key difference uh, that we're trying to do is that, so the goal is like when the page finished loading, uh, the user sh should have all the functionality that they expect. So we do have some sort of like uh, enhancement. So we load uh, scripts um, after the full page gets rendered and which provides uh, functionality uh, such as say uh, things like date picker, uh, some enhanced uh, navigation and so on. So, but the key thing is, you know, the moment they see a content on the page, that should be working. Um, so yeah, we um, basically, uh, from the components, we actually do some server-side DOM manipulation. We move all the scripts up, we inline them uh, if possible, uh, and then we move, push all the scripts down to the bottom. Uh, so we do uh, HTML response minification. We don't have to, uh, if you uh, put gzip, it's actually already good enough. I think the difference between uh, having both and just gzip is probably two, three kilobytes, which is actually quite small. We also enabled uh, HTTP2 uh, web server support. So this is one of the, uh, I guess, the uh, good thing about HTTP2 is it uh, does uh, fetch uh, resource uh, concurrently. So uh, it helps a bit, I suppose, uh, but we haven't really uh, you know, uh, done any uh, hard uh, measurements on it. Um, but to be honest, it's not everything uh, server, uh, server rendered. So we do have uh, uh, things like graph that is still generated at runtime. Um, you know, we have uh, SVG uh, methods to generate SVG uh, server side, but it's just that you know uh, we haven't really looked into that. Uh, also, the other uh, key thing is that you know you want to have uh, partial page refresh because now even though we have sort of like this. Um, uh, set up, uh, you know, if you're trying to navigate, you're still sort of like navigating in a, a conventional manner. So you actually, your page will sort of like disappear for a brief moment uh, while it actually loads the uh, new page. So there are sort of like libraries out there. Uh, one that is actually taken uh, um, uh, an interest uh, for me is Morphdom. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you heard uh, Live View. Uh, so the guys um, that developed the Phoenix web framework uh, for Elixir actually came up with this sort of like um, Technology, so uh, it's kind of like a combination of web sockets and uh, page refresh. So everything's uh, server rendered, and basically it just does does DOM diffing to just uh, update the the parts of the page that uh, is relevant. In terms of Java, Spring Boot, and Time Leaf, also uh, I guess it's pretty standard, but we do try to reduce uh, magic, more explicit code flow. I mean, it's hard to avoid it in Spring, uh, but we try our best just to make everything uh, quite explicit. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, we still use cache, although we now bound it to the session. So if we do have uh, some uh, issues, uh, we can actually ask the users to just log off and uh, restart the session. Same as before, gzip response compression. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, there's, I'm not sure if you've uh, heard of uh, Broadly, but uh, there's actually uh, a compression sort of like a standard or rather protocol, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, it does provide some uh, differences uh, uh, some improvements to uh, gzip uh, in, in trade as a trade-off to more uh, consuming more CPU cycles. Um, time lift is good; uh, it's quite flexible. But some of the issues that we uh, had, uh, you know, you know, we, we probably uh, 
would have avoided if you have something like a type template engine, so something that will actually tell you um, at compile time rather than runtime that you know there's a, you know wrong reference or uh, I'm using the wrong type. Uh, maybe in the future we'll look at some of these other other web frameworks. You know we have WebFlux, which is Netty based. Uh, uh, I think you've all seen the Micronaut presentation, which is uh, oh, sorry, not Micronaut Quarkus presentation, which is quite uh, interesting. There's sort of like another alternative called Micronaut. Uh, but in some other uh, themes we do use, uh, because we're uh, mostly developing in Scala, we use uh, HTTP and uh, there's a couple of HTTP for us. So just uh, reiterating again, so what we're sort of like working on is progressive enhancement. So at the time of uh, render, we want to have the actually application actually working. And when the script loads after um, the page rendered, uh, then that's when we provide additional functionality. So although in this sort of like instance, you sort of have to have uh, some agreed convention. So there still needs to be some coordination between all the verticals and what we call the application or the shell, because the application or the shell is uh, uh, responsible for routing. So they need to have some knowledge about you know, what to expect uh, and how to hook into all this sort of like different interaction. Uh, at, at the moment, it's sort of like ad hoc. Uh, we're not really using any sort of like standard approach, but maybe you know if you need to pass something like uh, something that's complex uh, attributes, uh, we can use the data attributes. So I mentioned a bit about developer experience. So the good thing though about micro front ends is the minimal context switching. So we had a monorepo for each vertical. So if you actually have to work on uh, something, develop a new feature, fix a bug everything is actually in one repo. You don't have to jump over a few different repos. And you can, out, it, uh, sorry, it also helps when you're actually writing your test, integration test, because everything is in one vertical. Of course, you also have the test for the uh, overarching uh, application, the shell, but uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, all your focus and concentration is just in that one code base. Um, one of the things that we try to support also is multiple environments. Uh, so uh, that's one of the good things about Spring or Spring Boot uh, and the Node.js ecosystem is that you, you can actually switch uh, between different environment profiles really quickly. And we use uh, like Spring Boot configuration profiles. So you have a dev prod, um, say staging, or you can create ad hoc one uh, depending on what you need. Same with Node-Convict. Uh, node so you can actually have a config folder where you actually specify different uh, sort of profiles and you can pass those uh, a flag into runtime to actually select a profile. And in Docker Compose, you can actually just put all this stuff in .env uh, files and you know you just uh, use or write a point the Docker Compose configuration to use this different profile to actually get uh, a different setup. And one thing that we try to do as well is actually to use uh, I get, well, I'm sorry, not use, but we try to focus to that uh, every vertical can actually be standalone. So it would have uh, uh, an embedded database support, and then you have the option based on that different profiles to actually sort of like expand the functionality bit by bit. So you start it up in H2, but then you can also connect to a Postgres database locally or uh, a Postgres database in dev. Uh, not only database, but we also develop, uh, I guess, all the uh, relevant um, um, downstream dependency, so such as uh, LDAP server, because some of, one of the authentication actually depends on uh, LDAP, so we're using single sign-on. Uh, so we actually do provide this mock LDAP server as part of the sort of like development experience. So the moment you say Docker Compose up, it'll sp spin up a mock LDAP, so you can actually easily test things locally. So um, mentioned about Docker Compose, so it uh, allows you to do end-to-end uh, -end, uh, and also helps during demos. So whenever we get asked, oh, can you show me what you've been working on? Uh, you, know, you just do a git fetch, git pull, and then Docker compose up, then uh, that person would have a standalone uh, uh, environment uh, that works uh, fully end to end. And like I mentioned before, uh, you can actually connect uh, different parts of the system uh, to others to, to actually uh, you know, say uh, test a particular feature. But of course, it adds complexity. So what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, we try to promote uh, a lot of these sort of like shared uh, assets uh, as a, a package. So in this uh, particular example is, uh, we publish everything into an own internal NPM package. So there's only one place um, where you can actually, uh, uh, well, the one source of truth rather. So uh, if uh, there's a new feature that requires an update package, we, uh, there's a lot less sort of like coordination, no copy pasting, just refer to the updated version of the package. So 
npm package also we use uh, shared libraries in jenkins uh, and also obviously docker based images and layers so one cool thing though about spring boot and timeleaf is that um, during development we actually uh, by default uh, creates sort of like three uh, different types of resource so you get uh, the html page so if you're doing local development that you have a full html page where you can actually test your components uh, the actual shell itself or the basically the, the application that you're developing actually calls up only a, par a portion of those uh, that page so it calls the fragment or the, the actual component so for other services that requires the raw data uh, you can actually get it uh, by uh, just the raw json um, data so uh, we doing this via the view resolver so if they, uh, we check the media type if they're asking for um, sorry uh, the both uh, path and media type so uh, if they're uh, looking for the JSON resources, then basically we unpack the sort of like the parameters from the uh, timeleaf template and return it as raw JSON. Uh, whereas with, I'm not sure if you're familiar with timeleaf, but uh, the UI itself is kind of like a nested component. So you can actually choose to get the whole page or you can sort of like traverse into one particular component. So it's kind of like uh, traversing to sort of like a subfolder within a um, hierarchy. And, sorry, a, a node within a hierarchy. Sorry, I'm, I do apologize if I'm speaking uh, really fast now because I'm pressed for time. Um, this is going to be the last section, and I think I have about five minutes left. Uh, so <clears throat> a few things that we observe. Uh, first of all, it's actually about the user expectations. What I mean by user expectation, because we are so used to uh, how modern web app uh, work, um, right? Um, you know, if you... Uh, show a, a server-side web application uh, to you know, someone uh, that is actually conditioned to use a rich web application, it's gonna feel a bit weird. I mentioned before content uh, jank, uh, when we actually move from page-to-page uh, -page navigation, you know, you have that sort of like a brief moment where the page disappear, uh, another uh, moment where the page sort of reappears, but then after that, there's sort of like this uh, phase where you know, the layout sort of like rearrange itself, you know, uh, due to uh, various other, um, I guess, um, uh, reasons like, say, uh, using web fonts. So, you know, things uh, will sort of like look out of, look out of place uh, a little bit. And the other thing is like lack of UI feedback. So you're sort of like uh, expect that if you click a button, there's sort of like some sort of like immediate feedback. Either it's a, a loading uh, spinner uh, before you can actually get or navigate it to another page. Whereas in the normal web or the server side one, uh, normally, it actually just sort of like waits in there. You'd have uh, some sort of like, um, uh, what do you call it, like a message on the bottom left-hand corner that's saying it's loading something. Uh, but it's not always very obvious. Some people, you know, if say we had issues with our downstream services and it's returning resources a lot longer than we expected, it feels like the page is just sort of like stuck there. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, obviously, you know, adding features uh, is not... Uh, I would say uh, not as easy uh, because a lot of this sort of like the modern ecosystem depends on one, say, um, a framework or so. So you, you probably uh, have to look for like a, a framework neutral functionalities, uh, things like uh, table sorting. You know, if you work in React, you probably know what libraries to use. If you work in Vue, there will be uh, going to be a plugin for that. Uh, in terms of performance itself, actually, uh, there's really no big uh, difference. Uh, but you know, what we're optimizing is actually not uh, performance, but actually the uh, user experience itself. So we're trying to minimize on the payload itself. Um, <clears throat> so so far, uh, you know, it's not bad. So you know, we have about 200 kilobyte uh, of payload uh, for a page. Uh, this is probably the cost that is incurred the first time the user actually hit. Uh, you know, basically access our app. Uh, half of it, which we really don't have control over because those are the standard styles, uh, you know, things like web fonts um, and the base uh, library. But once you get past that first page, when you're navigating uh, over the other pages, it's actually uh, quite fast because, you know, it only uh, retrieves uh, the stuff that is not cached, which is actually the HTML itself, and then whatever other scripts uh, that's required by the page that hasn't been cached yet. So we're actually averaging the browser cache functionality for that. Uh, yeah, performance uh, in line with other similar microservices. Uh, the UI itself uh, actually does very little work except for composing all these components together. Uh, additional functionality is done on the client side. 
And as I mentioned before, time to first, sorry, a time to first byte and time to first render is depends on the critical path of this lowest fragment or component. Um, you know, some of the stuff that we do, like the server side uh, optimization, uh, like the um, uh, inlining of the CSS, uh, JavaScript, and also rearranging uh, the DOM, uh, adds a bit of an overhead, but compared to, you know, I guess the latencies uh, in the uh, market, uh, the, I guess, uh, consumer's market, that's a, a, um, a trade-off. Uh, it is, uh, well, uh, that, that is worth it. And I think I am uh, good for time. Um, do you have any questions? Maybe, no? <laughs> All right, well, thanks for attending my talk. Uh, thank you. Um, On your way out, uh, please don't forget to give some feedback. Uh, I would really appreciate it. Uh, be honest, I think it's anonymous, right? Yeah, so I'm not gonna try and, and find you and uh, you know, trying to bug you if uh, you, know, uh, you give me some sort of negative comment. So anything appreciated. Uh, there's a bit of a QR code uh, to this presentation. Uh, right now it's still private, but uh, feel free to take a picture. Uh, I'll, I'll publish these slides uh, right after my talk. Thank you.